Good morning. Uh, my name is Reiner Sternfeld, and uh, uh, I'm not a librarian, although my eight-year-old daughter, Sophia, thinks that my dream is to become one. Uh, and today I'll be talking about modalities of reading, learning, and, and creativity in a digital society. And uh, I'm obviously going to be doing that from my, my perspective, from my life experience. And perhaps it's a little bit more useful if I can tell you a little bit about myself before I, I proceed. Uh, I'm an Estonian-born entrepreneur. I like to say I'm a curious human because it's getting increasingly more complicated to describe who or what I am, and maybe labels are not really important in this world. Uh, currently, I'm working as an investor at Nordic Ninja VC, which is a Japanese uh, venture capital fund in Europe uh, focused on investing in deep technology companies in the new Nordic region. And I'm also a co-founder of Code Yofi, which is a free autodidactic programming school for adults that is opening in, um, in, in a small town called Yofi in Estonia this fall. And uh, I, I was trained as a robotics engineer and a product developer in unmanned systems. And uh, I've been building technology companies, building products, building teams, building organizations, new business models for 20 years uh, this year. And from family companies to global corporations to startups to Silicon Valley corporations. And uh, I've, I've co-founded uh, 10 organizations and or companies and lived eight years in Silicon Valley. And, uh, and most things that I've been involved in have been around digitalization or, or, or data platforms or digital infrastructure, put it very bluntly. And, uh, and most of those things have been about leading complex projects and introducing new concepts and change uh, and managing that change. And uh, uh, maybe also in parallel, I have been fortunate enough to participate in some uh, notable organizations or projects, such as uh, been a board member at the World Ocean Council, uh, again, focused on how we share data around weather and climate, a uh, member of the White House Open Data Roundtable during the Obama administration, uh, designing the Statue of Liberty of Estonia, and designing the na nationwide fast charging network for electric cars, uh, also in Estonia. So uh, it's an honor to be here, and uh, because this is a special place for me as well. When I was in high school between 98 and 2001, I remember spending a lot of my Saturdays here at first mostly doing uh, research for school papers and later just for the books. Uh, I loved having access to any book I needed while I was here. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, we had a decent library at home and uh, we had access to satellite TV channels where I got my accent from. So I, I grew up watching American television. So the world was infinitely bigger inside our home than it was outside of it in already starting in 1989 where it was still the Soviet Union. Uh, but there was something special about this place, and, and now that our home is filled with books, uh, um, but, but it wasn't before I moved to California in 2012 when I first started to curate my collection of books um, mindfully and intentionally, um, and I've, I've learned how to reinvent myself, and in doing so, you make yourself vulnerable to being wrong and unlearn many things. Uh, that make you blind to new knowledge. And so I uh, learned to learn in a new way uh, that makes me question myself. And, and this presentation is really about this experience, so not pretending to, to, to be truth of any kind, but at least it's one perspective. Uh, trying to, so this is a technology issue here. Okay, here we go. So uh, I would start by asking, you know, how can libraries remain special? I said earlier that it, it's a special place for me, but how can, it, how can libraries remain special in the evolution of, of knowledge? Uh, you know, this is, this is a leviathan of an institution, and, and so are all public libraries, in, in my opinion. Um, when, when so much of the world's information is, is, is decentralized and communities are becoming online, and the creation and consumption of knowledge is, is driven online. How, how can libraries remain special? And, and I want to say that, that 
we are learning machines um, uh, as humans. We, we like to talk about machine learning and computer science, but, but I think we are as well are very much learning machines and this has just been accelerating. Uh, the number of research papers is, is doubling every nine years. Um, humans have wired up the natural world and we have most of the Earth's data at our fingertips and, and we are just learning how to manage all of that. We are now on, only now starting to uncover um, how the human brain works. So neuroscience is something that interests me, for instance. And everyone can be an author these days and publish their work online. Uh, uh, there's an author, uh, Jürgen Renn, from the Max Planck Institute in Berlin. He's written a book on the evolution of knowledge, which I, I recommend highly, uh, he, where he outlines the need for entirely new frameworks for understanding structural changes in, in systems of knowledge, especially in the age of Anthropocene. Um, so this information overload that we live in is, is overwhelming, and we have to find new ways to learn and, and relearn and use the power of technology and artificial intelligence to help us, but also how do we do this uh, so that we can stay human? And, and so this brings us to modern times, today's, uh, today's kind of topic. I, I, uh, I think that in the, you know, the last year and, uh, and some months uh, of, of, of working from home and, um, and working in a, in a hybrid format, let's say this way, uh, has really amplified many things that we already did before. And, and I like to say that crises don't uh, create trends, they just amplify them. So if somebody thinks that some new ways of working have just now been invented, then, then in fact we just have you know, been, become aware of these things. So uh, I'd like to point out three things that I think are, are really happening here. One is that we, go, we are going from an expensive, uh, quickly decaying education system, and it's just becoming more and more expensive. Uh, in relation to income and the quality and the application of that education. And we're turning more to a lifelong, community-driven, skills-based self-learning. There's a lot of hyphens there here. But, uh, you know, this is also the premise of the called Yuffie School, where we believe that, you know, uh, adults can have multiple careers. So this, this brings us to the second point, which is we, we're going from this classical notion of, of having one to four jobs in a, in a lifetime it, that spans throughout one career to multiple careers and a lifetime of jobs. And that means we're going to a third point, which is we, we were going from a dependent physical employee to an independent creator in the digital economy. So many things that, are, that are, we are discussing today are, are, are changing the way we work and the way we contribute to the world. And, and I think it's wonderful mainly because I think, you know, there are, there are obviously jobs that, that um, need machines and all that, but I think, you know, uh, it's, it's better for us if we are focused more on creativity than we are on repetitive tasks. And so there are some modalities that I wanted to address. Uh, obviously, again, this is, this is based on my experience, but one of the, one of the things that I, I have uh, really thought about myself is how do we read uh, what is reading and and you know when I first started when I first started uh, to pay attention to book collections I, I, I stumbled upon a book called uh, how to read a book which my kids of course laughed about it's like hey dad do you know how to read and so the the book really opened my eyes and I think this is like now 60 or 70 years ago when it was first published but you know um, I, I created my own framework. So one of the things is that you, I, I've created my own topics of interest, whether it's critical thinking or neuroscience or Anthropocene, um, you know, energy, things like that. And, and, and then I really carefully research what I want to read. Um, I spend quite a lot of time actually thinking about that, um, what, what to read. Uh, maybe I, I can spend even 20% if I, if I have uh, four to five books that I want to select. Maybe I spend like, you know, the time that I spent reading one book on, on researching what to read in the first place. And so I think that's, that's kind of interesting. So uh, the, the, the second uh, topic that I think is, is really important uh, here is how we read is, is again, we, we tend to think about reading as just uh, you know, analytical reading, but there are differences how you read poetry or philosophy or mathematics. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's really important to think about um, uh, the 
how how do we instill this knowledge that we just read into our own brain and and how reuse it because many a lot of the a lot of the people that read some some complicated topics they they tend to forget it i mean maybe you're underlining or or take some notes but i think it's it's sort of like um, a little bit of wasteful. So uh, I really recommend taking rigorous notes, and we, even even the note taking has changed uh, completely. I'll talk about that a little bit more in, in 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 the learning section. But you know, we're going from regular notes to to online notes to to things like Readwise, which 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 help us to uh, to compare our notes and our thoughts with other readers that have read this book. Uh, and then to things like uh, Rome Research, which are based on graphs, so you can create a graph, uh, a graph database based on your own uh, notes, and and therefore you know I, I can search for a keyword around I don't know what has Martin Luther King Jr. said about friendship, and all of my notes throughout 20 years are linked. When did I do that? From what was this source? How how could I structure my thinking better? How do I understand it? Because there's so much that's going on. So, uh, so that that's that's pretty much how I read. But then, also the the diff there's been a significant shift in how I buy books or consume books as well. Which is that if a book has a shelf life, it's uh, of course a subjective evaluation uh, made by my myself. But if a book has a shelf life under five years, I generally buy an ebook or borrow one from a local library. Uh, if if a book has a shelf life over 10 years, so I, I really focus on high quality books that I could pass on to my children, then then I then I generally uh, buy a physical book. So uh, and you know since I've done that, I have uh, you know cleaned up a lot of my 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 books in my library, uh, giving away books that I think that have a shorter shelf life that I've already read, so I don't need to really keep them. So I've given them away so other people can read them too. And so that's that's you know the way I, I organize them, and and now when I look at my physical books, it's 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 a completely different site than it was ten years ago. And of course, the majority of my book co collecting has been in the last ten years, so it wasn't that that organized uh, at all uh, before. Uh, so so that's important. The other thing that I've recently picked up is audiobooks, and that has particularly been interesting for me, mainly because I uh, I just finished uh, Barack's. Barack Obama's uh, mammoth of a biography or autobiography, uh, which he narrates himself. So if I, I compare what I could have gotten out of that book by just by reading it in a, in a physical format, and I do think this is a book that can last over 10 years, so I would buy a physical book. In this particular case, this was uh, a gift to me. Uh, and and I, that was my first audiobook that I listened to, and I was really impressed by the tone. So some of the things that when you write, you lose the tone. And of course, if it's also written by the author, I think it's, it's, it's uh, something that, that, that adds color to the meaning, uh, obviously. And biographies are stories. Uh, that that are easier to grasp. You know, I, I wouldn't probably uh, listen to a, um, a mathematics book, which I don't know if it's even possible. Uh, so but history in general is 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 fairly easy to consume in audiobooks. So I'm still exploring and dabbling in that world. And of course, the, the maximum effect I have now been buying audiobooks, including books that I already have in a physical form, buying in uh, uh, an audiobook format. So when I read and listen at the same time, that that uh, you know uh, has maximum effect in terms of understanding the content. So that's kind of uh, uh, the way I think about reading today, and it's it's obviously uh, not uh, final, but but that's how I, I know. You know, reading takes you to this other thing that I'm really passionate about, which is learning. Uh, so you 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 really you know question yourself. Uh, as an engineer, we are taught. Uh, to question ourselves is our knowledge really the correct one and and but reading and and learning to learn is is really not that useful if you don't have a hands on practice it depends it varies from uh, you know obviously from domain to domain but when we talk about you know applied domains such as robotics uh, when I studied robotics fifteen years ago, all of the things that I studied then are pretty much outdated. The things that I had studied before that, physics and mathematics, they still uh, remain the same. And so hands-on practice is, is the way to do it. It's, it's you're pushing the frontier. So very often you're creating new knowledge as, 
um, as, you're, as you're practicing. So it's really hard to turn to somebody else. And so that's where the power of, of communities and mental models come in. Uh, mental models are, are, are something that, is, that are extremely powerful. Uh, I encourage people to keep track of your own mental models and, and explore others. So again, create a, a playbook for yourself, how to think about things. It helps you to cut through a lot of the overwhelming information that, that you might have uh, in, in, in your kind of domain uh, or wherever. And, and I you know, encourage to figure out who are the smartest people in your domain and try to be in that community. So, so that's, that's really important, I think, because, because uh, you know, uh, it's really uh, hard to replace a community. So, you know, you, it doesn't matter where they are, whether it's, whether it's uh, they're authors of books or, or people on Readwise or Twitter or Rome Research, you create co uh, collective knowledge. Obviously, in software, you have things like GitHub and, and things like that. But then there's, there's wealth of knowledge in, on YouTube or Khan Academy, Coursera, and, and even Twitch, which was created uh, to watch other people play video games, which was you know, something to laugh about in the beginning, but now has a massive, massive community in many other domains other than uh, computer gaming, of course. So, so we, we are really going from, from simple note-taking to, to personal graphs, to network graphs, and I've, 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 used, I've used Rome Research now for about a year, and it's, it's just a, a, an in, incredible amplifier of, of knowledge uh, that, that we all can use, I think. Uh, so, turning to creation uh, or creativity, uh, creativity is, is, is really one of the most interesting things uh, for me, is like, where does that come from? And, and um, it's individual, obviously, but I think that in, in many respects, this last year has taught us that you know we, we, we do we do need deep work, we do need uh, alone time, and we need time in a community. So I think what has happened also is that we we are we have learned to modulate between different modalities. So you you switch from deep work to community uh, co-creation, and uh, I'm an investor in a in a Finnish company called Varia, which are creating a hum, you know mixed reality systems at human eye resolution where uh, at, at the movement of a dial, you can go from 100% real world to 100% virtual world, or you can select what is going to be real around you and what's going to be virtual without being able to actually say whether it's real or, or virtual. It's, it has this matrix type of feeling to it. But I think what's happening there is that you see how, how designers and engineers and marketers are working together to create new, new things, new uh, experiences. And, and I think that you know, these new systems allow us also to ask ourselves, uh, what is the impact of this new thing that we are trying to create? Uh, you know, I, I, I always like to say that, you know, uh, this is a, not, not my thought, but there was a, a British futurist uh, that wrote a book, uh, J James Martin, that wrote a book uh, about 22 years ago. Uh, the meaning of the 21st century, and, and in that he, he uh, argues that in the 20th century, humans really figured out how to invent things. So we've become pretty good at, at making, making stuff, and whatever we put our mind to, we probably can create it uh, in, in, in one way or another. But what we have to do in the 21st century is to figure out how to control the, our inventions. And I think this is not, not, there's no better time than now to think about that. And, and here we turn to things like radical empiricism, which is using data and artificial intelligence to, to solve problems. For instance, if you need to create a new drug, it it's, you know, uh, generally takes billions of dollars and, and up to 10 years to, to create something. With new technology, you can create very specific uh, treatment for very specific people with very specific conditions uh, in, in record time in a much safer manner and le less uh, with a smaller budget and then have versions of those. So, so the digital world is only now starting to emulate the, the analog world. So when we talk about creativity in, in a broader sense, not just technology, we talk about the arts, you know, we talk about NFTs, non-fungible uh, tokens, which, which are a representation of, of the physical world in a way that I can say you know, that this is an authentic piece of art. Uh, and I think we really have to go from creating new technology to asking what is the world we want to see 
And so we should have bigger debates, more uh, uh, positively aggressive debates about you know the, the the privacy implications, the impact of technology to our children and, and nature. So I think this is really we need, what we need to ask ourselves: What is the world uh, we want to we want to live in? And uh, maybe uh, to kind of uh, wrap up. Um, Earlier, I said that you know we we're, we're moving from a model from, of consumption to a model of, of creation, and and I think this is very true also for libraries. At least I like to think that um, you know archival is still important, uh, but it's the modality that's changed across consumption and creation. And I do think it's time to go digital. And if I think about you know all the places that I've traveled around the world in the last 10 years, there have been times where I practically lived on airplanes and you know, you, you want to go to a library to take refuge, to think about things, but you also want to go and to meet maybe sometimes other people. So I think, you know, it's, it's easy to see how technology renews itself every few years. Uh, so it is replaceable. What is hard to replace is community and, and which is why I think libraries have an opportunity to to bring communities together whether it's physical or digital it's it's like a small island where you can create your own world and uh, and we, one just needs to decide what is the world that we want to create for for each specific library at least i like to think that so that concludes my my presentation and i'm happy to answer uh, any questions thank you reiner uh, first a small technical announcement um, if you are having any troubles changing the language, just reload the web page and click on the flag at the upper right corner of the web page and choose the language you want to hear the seminar. But uh, we have some questions from our audience, and the uh, first one is quite long. So, you stated that in the society we have to move from a model of consumption to a model of co-creation. Where is the place of libraries in supporting creativity? Because uh, we, uh, meaning libraries, mm -hmm. have been uh, mostly helping people to find their way uh, to the information they need, trust in the information to consume. Mm -hmm. But what should we do for creativity, at least from mm -hmm. your point of view? Uh, that's, a, that's a, the same. It's, it's kind of a continuation of this topic that I ended with. In, in every uh, uh, kind of a community, uh, whether it's digital or uh, or physical, you can see that there are, uh, you know, an overwhelming majority of people that are consuming, and there may be maybe a, a single-digit percentage of people that are creating content. Whether it's you know, even think about the libraries. How many authors uh, do you have in a library, or how many people do you have as, as visitors, right? So, or, or you know, people that create videos on YouTube and people have watched videos on YouTube. There are a lot of communities like that. I've been involved in many communities as well, or creating communities. And, and, I, and I think it's, it's key for a community to, to bring those people together, but I also think it's key for a thriving community to, to allow people to co-create new things. So it's not just one to one, it's like you know, one book to one person, it's, it's one to many and, and many to many. And you know, when, you, when, you, when you try to address this and curate this by giving uh, specific topics or challenges to the world, people are infinitely creative to, to, to do things. Um, uh, one example uh, from uh, 2013, uh, the company that I created was Planet OS. Uh, was, w our first name was Marine Explorer. And, uh, and the goal for Marine Explorer, well, what happened was we created the world's first big data platform for design for ocean data. And we brought together uh, a lot of the publicly available open data around weather, uh, climate, uh, atmospheric data, things like that, coastal data. And, and then we, we, we ran into uh, uh, Dr. Chris Clark at Cornell University, and he had, over, a, over the span of many decades, uh, recorded North Atlantic right whales, a census of North Atlantic right whales. How many are there? Uh, because the number had decreased uh, down to 400 because they were in Cape Cod and, and ship, ships were coming in in the Port Authority of Boston. And basically, they wanted to understand, like, how many are there? So they were counting them uh, manually. 
manually uh, looking at the audio recordings. Now, we took that the entire archive, we put it up on a community called Kaggle, which is a community of for data scientists, but anybody can be a data scientist these days. And we opened up a challenge saying that, you know, whoever increases the model of accuracy, which at the time was, I think, 74%, then wins $10,000. And we, our, as a small company, we still put up $10,000 in, in partnership with Cornell University. In a matter of three weeks, uh, two engineers from the United States Air Force uh, improved this model from 74% to 92%. So all the recordings, you were able to increase the census of, of North Atlantic right whales. What does that mean? Is that you had people that had been creating content uh, collecting data, looking at it like, you know, kind of one-to-one -one model, but then you opened it up to the entire community of people that were also non-specialists, they had ideas. And this idea was actually quite trivial, uh, essentially because they converted the, the audio files into uh, spectral images and were able to find the fingerprint of a North Atlantic right whale up call. And then using that kind of image analysis, you were able to count how many are there. I re I'm sorry, I, I digress, but the, the point is that you, you need to give communities new challenges. Even if you're just making stuff up, is like, what are the problems that we need to solve? And if you give them time, and if you give them an incentive, and, and, and increasingly, you know, if you look at Generation Z, they, they care more about the, the, the purpose of a job than the job itself. I think you have people that will create magical things and improve the world as, as we know it. I'd like to expand, expand the question. Uh, what kind of competencies uh, or what kind of knowledge the librarian of the future who curates this kind of uh, expanding knowledge, cooperation, what kind of person, at least in your view, it should be? It's not the person who takes a book and brings it to you. It's, it's a different one. How would you... Uh, describe what would yeah. the outlines of that kind of competencies yeah. and persons yeah. be? Well, obviously there are things that are never going to change. You have to be uh, empathic to the to the you know to the not to the reader but the the user of that book. Let's say this way, um, you have to be curious yourself, and you have to have a you know a breadth of knowledge of what is out there. Uh, but I think it's really important to understand the kind of the levels of of uh, uh, of complexity as well you can describe one topic in many many different levels and and you know the the future librarian uh, you know it's it's uh, kind of like a, a guide right but it's not just the content that they need to know they need the frameworks and you know how do you connect these kinds of things is like you know uh, how are you know it, it, things connected inter, in an interdisciplinary way right so it's like uh, I don't know, there's a, for instance, there's a book by, uh, by uh, uh, a modern-day philosopher, Alain de Botton, The Architecture of Happiness. So it's like looking at, at happiness of, of human beings in space, looking at different architectures over a span of time, uh, you know, in human history, uh, and then how do we need to create new architecture because he thinks that current architecture is ugly, for instance, and then things like that. So you, you have to be aware of these different concepts more than I think you need to be aware of particular books. Maybe you're not, you know, you can't, you can't have every book in the world in a physical format, but you can guide them to specific content. So it's, it's, it's the physical stuff that you have in your library it's just uh, maybe some exclusive things that are exclusive to your, 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 your country, for example. You have like a, your ethnic kind of uh, like history and things like that. But if you look, look at the bigger picture, if you think across the border, if you think about you know, uh, across the planet, if you think about <laughs> uh, in an interplanetary way, so to speak, then, then I think that's like the best librarian you can have. It's, it's really like a guide to, to where you want to go without actually going with you. But it's like, hey, I think if you think it like that, go, go and search. Which is interesting. I just got a question about librarians. I, I'm sorry I'm not following the chronological order of questions, but it's, we have time. I'm, I'm using my privilege as a moderator, and, and I'm asking the question anyway. So, do you see that future libraries, uh, or sorry, do you see that future, uh, future libraries, have, uh, libraries have librarians at all? 
uh, maybe the artificial intelligence, the robots, the uh, machine learning could do the trick. Maybe, yeah. maybe libraries don't need librarians, because at least uh, I would expand the question, what you were talking about before isn't the definition of a traditional librarian, yeah. although our conference today is not about traditional yeah. librarians. But back to the question, maybe it's all robots and artificial intelligence in the future. I, I, I don't quite I, I think that it's going to be you know, turtles all the way down, as they say. I don't think it's going to be just, you know, uh, um, as long as there is, uh, well, for, for the first of, first of all, I, I'm the kind of a person that likes to have a backup anyway. So I think having some sort of a paper-based or, or any other physical means or analog mean, uh, means of, of uh, recording a memory um, is, is important. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be paper in the future. Paper, everything is temporary anyway, but like, how do we think about things? Uh, so I think that's really important anyway. So there's, there's always archival and, and knowledge of that, so that's cool. Um, when it comes to like, the digital world and co-creation, again, I think like, if we want to keep things alive and keep, things, keep people uh, you know, being interested in things, that if, if, uh, if people find out there are some very cool people in that library that are interested in one or the other topic without being focused on, like in the universities, you can go to a university, you know that somebody's doing massive research on a topic and you talk, talk to that person, but librarians might be just people that are, as I, as I mentioned, like, you know, guidebooks. Uh, you can use the internet for that and, you know, the internet is, is there and maybe this is one of those areas where the library can become uh, an island in the world of libraries uh, it can become digital. Uh, you know, one of the key aspects is that you have some exclusive material here on site and also as backups. But, but I do think one needs to think about specific topics that libraries can can solve. Um, you know, um, it, it's easy it's easy to overwhelm people if you talk about everything. You have to focus on something so that. You know, you, you, you can't just focus on your national kind of output. Uh, you, you have to focus on something else. Otherwise, you're, you're risking to be marginalized completely. So uh, I'm not giving a straight answer because I, I don't have one uh, primarily, but I, but I do think that it needs to be more. The future librarian is going, to be, is going to exist, but it's going to exist in a different form. So, I mean, we can always find a book, and it's super easy to create already a digital system to find a physical book, or you don't need people to walk you to a book or something like that, uh, unless it's a task to, to, to dive into some chaotic things and connect the dots, so. Great, but another one. What would you personally expect from libraries? How could libraries support your lifelong learning journey? Is there something that only libraries can provide mm -hmm. in the context of your yeah. uh, presentation? Mm. Well, from a personal, deeply personal perspective, what, what, I, what I would really appreciate from um, a library is also to help me understand how to structure uh, knowledge uh, and, and information. You know, Google says they want us, you know, the, to organize the world's information. And, uh, there's, there's, uh, you know, a big. Sh there was a big shift when Google came, going from, you know, sort of a semantic web to an understanding that hey, you can have a pile of socks in a big room. You just tell us to find the yellow socks, and we'll find you. In a digital world, that's super easy. In the physical world, maybe not so easy. Um, so I think that you know what 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 people feel right now is uh, they feel overwhelmed even when you can find anything on, on Google. You can go down the rabbit hole and you don't even know where you are. There's no map of the internet. There's no map of the knowledge. And I think that's missing from schools, that's missing from people everyday life, and maybe this is one of those roles of, hey, we are a new library. We will help you to navigate the world of knowledge, what is out there, and what is the level, what is the maturity. Like in technology, there is TLRs, technology readiness levels, mm -hmm. TRLs, um, and so you can have a similar concept in in, in knowledge and, and libraries. Like we, you know, this is a map of the world's knowledge. This is how much we have of it. This is where where you are. You know, so that we become more self-aware. I feel that too often people find out about something, become 
uh, too confident about their knowledge and 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 just knowing not knowing what they don't know is 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 you know obviously you can't but being aware that there's something out there that you still don't know and and maybe there are people that help you to create a map of that unknown universe help you to become more humble and help you to find the answers you're looking for so i i do think this is like more meta than than we acknowledge okay but next one i'd like to ask uh, uh, is is a quite practical question mm -hmm. one could argue you're quite close to technology and innovation well and uh, and uh, w w when you walk around in library in practical sense, you go there, you get some services, you get, uh, you get a book, for example. But uh, uh, how do you see a technology and innovation could, in practical terms, change the library, the same uh, services you're using? Have you had any ideas? Uh, uh, w w what you would, uh, like yourself, what you would like to propose, what should libraries do? You sometimes, m m maybe it isn't so, so swift as you would like it to be if some service or something yeah, else. Yeah. I, I do think that when you want to go from point A to point B, you have to leave point A. <laughs> and so uh, there needs to be something different, and, and, and that's something different. You know, it used to be that library had all, all the books and you didn't now you can buy anything and 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 even have it as an ebook and and things like that of course not everybody has to buy why do you want to buy something so there's an environmental aspect that i think libraries will always have hey why do we keep like buying and consuming all these books are standing on the bookshelf anyway right so just why don't you borrow it and return it so there's an aspect of human memory when you have a bookshelf and you see what what's happening you can digitalize that as well. A server also consumes power. A server also consumes yeah. power, exactly. So there's a, there's a massive uh, exercise in the world where, as we are all participating in it. What is our own footprint, physical or digital? I mean, the, the complete, the total footprint that we have as, as humans, our carbon bodies, uh, but also the digital uh, kind of uh, representation of our life. But I think there's also like the efficiency of learning and, and, and something that is missing. It's learning is still hard. We're still biological beings. You know, you can read, you can look at the videos, you can do all these different things. But it's currently sort of a little bit uh, free-flowing in the sense that libraries could have people that know how to learn or learn how to learn and help to maximize understanding some sort of content some sort of a topic whether that is you know as i mentioned earlier like reading and listening at the same time you know that one of the things that libraries provide for me which is the, the of course just personal but i i don't think i'm the only one is there's so much noise everything not just the uh, audio noise visual noise uh, noise of information coming in there's two the 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 noise to signal ratio is uh is, is out of control, let's say this way. And I think libraries could provide that if you say like, hey, you want to know anything that you want about rockets? Okay, come in, we have this environment, you have like, I don't know, virtual reality goggles, we have these books that you, you, you can enter and we, we will provide you with, you know, let's do, you do this, you know, 24 hours, 48 hours, you consume all this information, we'll, we'll help you, maybe there's somebody to help you guide this through. And then, then you immerse yourself into this new, problem space that helps you to understand a particular topic. Uh, very good learners already are doing that. I mean, but, but I think that not enough people are doing that. And I think that's also fueling a little bit of disinformation. There are people that are using this chaos uh, that have bad intentions. We are seeing that in politics, we're seeing this public discourse, discourse that are using the weakness of people to keep attention to to navigate information and and have their own daily lives to manage. I don't have like 48 hours to kind of do this at home. Maybe there's an environment where I can really maximize my learning. You know, there's a, how do we, you know, how should I eat properly? You know, how, you know, what is the, the nutrition thing from gut microbiomes to how does food impact my brain? You know, I do think there are ways how how libraries can impact the society better than just being kind of a, uh, in a way, an always welcoming, but still passive uh, 
you know, collection of memory of, of humanity. I, I think we, we, we could benefit as society from more active libraries. In a not, nutshell, you would like to see libraries are more proactive educational ed institutions, basically. In my view, I think that if, if, you, if libraries can become more active community organizers or helping us to become super learners or eliminate uh, or, or reduce the amount of people that can be um, influenced by uh, uh, this information, then that's a big win. And if you, have a, if you have that, if you're a community organizer, then you have the power and the leverage and the respect and probably the funds uh, to do everything that you already are doing, which currently, you know, increasingly is becoming more risky because people can always say, hey, why do you need all this money? Why are these books here? You know, like we can access anything anywhere. But I th do think you can, you, can, you can use that knowledge to drive community somewhere. And that means, of course, not just technical tools. I mean, there's, you know, expertise, but it's, it's again, as soon as you learn a new technology or a new skill, you start to ask yourself, why am I doing this? Like, this is just a means to an end. What is that end? We have to ask ourselves, what is, what is that end? Well, thank you, Rainer. Uh, thank you.